So, good morning. Thanks uh, for being here. I'm really thrilled to come and speak in uh, Zurich. Hopla. Okay, start good. And uh, share with you uh, the work that we did on this matter. So, I'm Alex Maslow. I work at uh, Octo Technology in Lausanne. So we're a small firm, we're 15 in Lausanne and 250 in uh, Paris. And uh, what, we think that there, what we see is that we have more and more uh, customers or prospects or friends or whatnot with uh, big data problems. Okay. And that's good for us. And these people use technology and we advise them to use some technology and they have some problems. So I will present some of the technology that we use with our uh, customers, and also some of the technology that we don't use, or maybe we don't use yet, because they are more on the fun side, or more on the next step to come. So we are this, uh, this firm in uh, Lausanne. We do recruit talent in big data, data science, and other topics. But today, that's not uh, the point. Today, what I want to share with you is um, the question that we've asked ourselves during our 20% of uh, free time research development, how you may call it. We wanted to make a simple, uh, scalable architecture to be able to dispatch, to transpose, to visualize data in near real time and also to be able to store it and then analyze it a posteriori, to make maybe some machine learning or visualization on a whole bunch of data. And that was uh, the question because it's a pattern that seemed to me interesting at the time. That's a pattern that we find over and over in real-world problems. And the first thing that we ask ourselves, okay, cool, we need to find data. And there are plenty of data available. There's a great part of the internet and the world in which we live. More and more data are available. I come from bioinformatics background, so there is plenty of scientific data, bioinformatics data, health. There is, of course, energy. Okay, plenty of things coming with IoT, uh, social media. Of course, there's also some things in the finance industry and insurance, but somehow we wanted to, be, uh, to take a step uh, beside our day-to-day -day work. And we wanted to also to choose a, a topic which matters to almost everyone. So we pick up transport, because I think a lot of you use public transportation to come here this morning. And it's super strong in the, I think, the Swiss uh, culture too. So transport in Switzerland, it's train. It's not only the SBB, it's uh, plenty of smaller uh, train companies all over the country. It's uh, buses, city buses, post buses. And I think most of my time of development, in fact, for this project was done during my commute in train and post buses. So that happened more than once that I just missed my stop because I was too uh, focused on what I will try to present you today. Uh, there are also boats in the public transport system. So we have land, we have sea somehow, we have air. There are also gondolas that can be part of the public transport situation. And what is great in, uh, in, uh, in Switzerland is that all this public uh, transport system, which is something that more than 170 companies across the country, uh, they are grouped together into a union of public transport or something like that, which allow us to have uh, Abonnement General, the Swiss Pass, which allow us also to have applications that maybe you use in your mobile phone that will regroup, give you schedule or planning or buy fares across these uh, different uh, companies. Of course, we're not the only one to play with those data or to make a business with this new data and build applications. Okay, that's just a couple of them. There is this uh, station board 
uh, on the SBB website, what are the next trains that will leave uh, Zurich uh, station. Um, there is a mobile application that will tell us, oh, I have a train between I don't know, Geneva and Lucerne, and the train is between Geneva and Lausanne, and it will be late in, by four minutes in Lausanne, and so on. And there is also this application, which is closer than what we will present today, which is a map, um, where you see the vehicle, their position, more or less their current position. You see them moving. The more you zoom, the more you see buses and finer grain uh, transport. And what we want to do today is to, oh, yeah, two things where we want to go. I will at one moment fall from that thing, that's for sure. Uh, two things, sorry. It will be an application for real-time visualization and also a posteriori analysis. We will store data and then be able to, uh, to run some, uh, some program to, uh, to ask and answer some question. Of course, all the code there is uh, on GitHub, so don't hesitate then to try or ask questions if you have any. I start with the demo of the real-time uh, application. So here is a map of uh, Switzerland, so you could move in and then you have station here. The station, the bigger, means that there is more, mo more train that will leave the station. We have this quarter showing how, how many trains are late. Um, if we zoom in, of course, we see the train moving. So there is this whole interaction. If we mouse over a, a map, it will show us the next departure from this map, and so on, and so on. And just for fun, we also make the super cool uh, mundane clock, because it's a nice piece of uh, JavaScript to do. <laughs> All right. So let's get back to our, our uh, somehow our table of content, the agenda of the day. So we're able to build a simple, scalable infrastructure to dispatch, transform, and visualize in near real time massive data. We want it to scale, and also to uh, to achieve this uh, analysis with the, the stored data. And it's pretty simple. Okay, we have vehicles. Positions, we have station board information. I am in Zurich, what are the next train to leave? I can capture that in real time. And then I will dispatch it to my web users. And also, I will store it and I will propose a way for more data analysts or data scientist people to dig into them. That's the architecture of the thing. And the first thing we want to focus is simple. Okay. And uh, because there's not much, okay, in fact, uh, if, we, if, we, if we look at this architecture. But if we want to scale and go into the big data journey, nothing is really simple at first, okay? This is a map of uh, the technology that are available to you. Databases, language, framework, visualization tools, uh, message brokers, and so on. This is a map that is actualized even several times uh, a year by Matt Turk and his, uh, and his uh, folks. It's always moving. And believe me, there are a lot of components in this, on this map which are not that simple. Okay, and I think no one can really have a, an understanding of all what is this map, and this map always evolves. So we try to go on the, to keep on the simple side of it, and we will focus on each of this, uh, on this brick. Um, try to show the technology that we choose. Also, also propose a couple of other uh, technologies. Something which is important to remember, that's, that's an R&D project. That's a proof of concept aimed also for us to have fun and discover technology. And th there are some tools that will be presented here that are certainly not suited for a production-ready of such an application. In fact, if a customer comes to ask us, would you use this database that I will talk to you about for this problem, we clearly say, no, it's not suited. There are other ones which are way better suited. But that's not important for today. OK, let's start at first by the first brick of uh, the architecture, which is 
dispatching events. Okay? Quite easy. We have vehicle positions um, and, uh, and the station boards. And we need first, before dispatching them, to acquire them. So all these vehicles, they do have a GPS, and most of them, they transmit in near real time their position to Post Auto, to SBB, or whatever company. Of course, we don't have access as outsider. We do not have access to this information. Uh, so we have to find a proxy. This ca information can be found. Okay? The information on vehicle position can be, we can find a proxy to them with, um, by making uh, just HTTP REST query to the SBB. So we have to try to keep it low to be under the radar, not to, uh, okay, to, 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 to go too, too, too hard on their uh, information system. But we can nonetheless grab the information. For the schedule, um, for the list of station boards, there is easier. There is this uh, open data transport API, which is evolving also, but which offers us a very convenient way to know which are the next train and okay and so on. It's this API which is used by a lot of the mobile application that we have. They go and hit this. Uh, this, uh, this uh, API. So we can ask these uh, this APIs, get the information. To do that, we just run a simple uh, Node.js script, but whatever Perl, if you want script or whatever language, could be enough to make a few requests and push them for further. Just to see what it will, uh, it will get for vehicle position, more or less, we'll have a train or bus ID. We'll have, um, I don't know, where it goes to, and its current position, latitude and longitude. If we go to station boards, okay, one station board is, I don't know, it's Lausanne. Where is Lausanne? Geographical coordinate. Where are the what are the next departure in Lausanne? We have a train leaving to Domo in uh, 2013. It w it's announced four minutes late, and uh, also we have more information. We'll go back for the analysis step, which is a kind of forecast of the um, of the. Do you hear me like that? A forecast of the um, how full it is. So we can get this information, and then we need to push it forward. And what we use to message broker and push event, and then the, the remaining part of our architecture can then register to that. And for that, we use uh, Kafka. We use Kafka because <laughs> it's clearly uh, done, uh, done for real-time data uh, processing. It's uh, uh, real-time data pipelining, more precisely. The idea is that we have application. We have producers of information that will push events to Kafka, okay, to a Kafka cluster or Kafka server. And then we have other applications that will somehow consume the information, that will register. And this broker, this message broker in the middle, this Kafka layer, will ensure that if it fails, all the consumers get back the details that they missed, and so on and so on. So we get, we get out of this piece, we get this piece out of our, uh, our mind, it's also something, in a, it's also uh, an infrastructure that scales very well. We can handle, handle uh, uh, easily up to 100,000 messages per second, so far beyond our problem today. And the producer of information, of course, is our node uh, GS script, and the consumer is the real-time visualization and the pipeline for storage. Okay. We use Kafka, but there is way more than one way to do, uh, to do message blocking. Other famous solutions are certainly RabbitMQ, ZeroMQ, and many other that uh, I don't know of. OK, we acquire data. We have a dispatcher. Now we can start to store them. And storing very often in this world means we need to reformat the data, maybe transform it a little bit remove some redundant fields because it will uh, just burn a uh, disk. 
and push it to a storage. And to do that, we decided to go with Logstash. Okay, Logstash is really a pipe component that will do exactly that. I take events, or I take uh, yeah, messages, transform them, and push them forward. And they naturally push to the Elastic uh, Search uh, database. Elastic Search is a, it's a document store. Um, Yes, it's a document store, it's easy to install, it scales well, it's very convenient to query and so on. It's maybe not the best suited database for the problem at hand, but it will do the job. We can store the information in Elasticsearch, but we can also store the information in, uh, in flat files, because maybe it's more convenient for your post-processing or just for uh, viewing things. It takes less uh, uh, space on your desk. Again, we could have used other tools, okay, like Flume. In fact, we started with Flume, which is also a pipelining uh, uh, project. We somehow abandoned it. I mean, we abandoned it after a few hours because, I don't know, okay, it's a R&D project, okay, so sometimes you say, oh, it doesn't work like we want. Oh, let's search. It works in 15 minutes, was up and running, so it was an easy choice. Uh, but there is also FileB. There is a whole list of, this, of these tools to, to pipe information, and they're really inherited from the, the, the they get a big traction from the, um, the log processing uh, world, uh, usually. The database, so I, I said that Elastic is not the best way to, stock, to store these time series events. There are time series databases, but there are also more all-purpose databases that would have been more suited, columnar databases, like, like HBase, the Hadoop world, or Cassandra is a very uh, powerful uh, storage that would be way more suited for uh, yeah, production-oriented uh, development. So here we are. We are dispatching the, 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 the events, station boards and position, and then we can store them for months. And we'll see at the end of the talk what we can do then with these events. Now, we go to the other part of the, of the pipeline, the real-time processing uh, part. And until now, it was kind of somehow easy, at least at the, at the proof of concept level, because it's only configuration. Okay, you write a few lines of, uh, of node to request a, a couple of APIs, but everything else, Elasticsearch, Kafka, Logstash, is only some configuration, and uh, it's, there is no real code written to handle that. But of course, for the upper uh, level, then we need to dive a little bit more in, uh, in, uh, in code. So, the first thing we have to do with our events, we need to transform them. And we need to transform them because somehow we have um, atomic events. A train, remember, tells us, tell us, oh yeah, I'm, a tra I'm the train 123, I am at this geographical coordinate. That's it. It doesn't say if it stopped, if it's uh, where it was uh, 10 seconds ago. It doesn't say if it's uh, near a station. Okay, So we need to transform that to remember what was the last position. And if it has not changed in the last uh, 10 seconds, we can estimate that, is, that the train is stopped. And if the train position is within, I don't know, 100 meter radius from a station, we can even say, oh yeah, this train is stopped in a station. So we can reconstruct a global map of the, of the, um, of the situation. We need this state persistency. We also need state persistency because the train doesn't tell us, yeah, I have finished, I'm home. No, it just disappears from the grid. So we must keep track of saying, yeah, we have not have any information for train 123 for, I don't know, one minute. Let's consider it's off the grid, and so on. So we need this uh, to digest the input flow, but also to process it with some uh, state persistence. And of course, to be able to say, okay, give me the position of all the trains, for example. And to do that, there are, there are many possibilities. Okay. The one we took, or one of we took, the one I present uh, here today, okay, um, it's based first on Scala for the development language. 
uh, not only working in Lausanne that we are strongly influenced by Scala, but I think it's a great language. It's really a beautiful language. Um, somehow I went from Perl to, uh, to Scala. That was a pretty big jump in my uh, great language adoration. But it's really worth it. It's suited for big data. It's functional and OP. How many people here do program in Scala? Yeah, it's good. Okay. It's really something that's really worth considering. Okay, that's not for the language, but we could have used Python or, or, or Java, the same thing. Then, to store the state, that's a bit more tricky, what we do here is that we use actors. Actors, they are small entities that have a state and then can easily commute, um, they can easily uh, communicate with each other. So you send a message to the, state, to, to, to the actor and the actor will maybe send another message to some other actor or back to you, change its state. So it's very natural to say one train per actor. And an actor is super lightweight. You can, you can put uh, tens of thousands of, of actors on the laptop. It will be fine. So it's not like threads that you have to be careful. You can really scale them. So you can have one actor per train, one actor per station. And then a train is an actor, so it will automatically know, oh yeah, I know my position. Now you send me a new position for me. Yeah, I know if I have moved or not. Okay. And I can talk to all the stations at once and say, oh, give me your position so I can decide if my train is stopped in the station. So the whole status of one train is captured within uh, this, action, this, uh, this, uh, this actor. Actor is, is it, it's an old uh, paradigm, so we can refer to the talk, the great talk that we had uh, just before. It's, it's, it was first designed in the 70s, in 73. It's a really appealing uh, model. Now, with the ACA implementation, it's a very usable model. Okay, it's easy to use. But the thing is that it's very often hard to, uh, to find problems where it suits the actor model. And this was a perfect case and was pretty happy because sometimes you have a model and you just make it fit because you love actors. That's not very clever. Okay. <laughs> to to, 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 to um, pack together Scala, actor, the REST API, and so on, we use the play framework because it's well designed and very well suited to, uh, to that question. So we use actors. We could have used other things, other framework from this complex event processing, such as Storm or Flink or whatnot other, uh, other framework. Certainly, we could have used Spark Streaming. That this is certainly the best choice for this kind of problem. Okay, and I see a couple of persons. I don't see very well in the, in the room, but okay. I see a couple of persons nodding. And uh, Spark is, is, is kind of wonderful. It does also uh, streaming. The things that when we launched uh, this proof of concept process, the time state and the time persistence, the, the, the state persistence was not really matured or I could not figure exactly how to, uh, to, to make it work at the time. But I would really go back with Spark Streaming. Okay, we have an infrastructure, okay? Storage, processing, dispatching, acquisition, and then actors and REST API to expose the data. That starts to be uh, yeah, a decent uh, architecture for a sim simple proof of concept uh, project. And we need to talk a little bit about uh, operations, infrastructure, and also talk a little bit about performances. Okay. So the thing is that we need to install all of these components. And uh, obviously, it's not easy to install that on, on your laptop. Okay. Oh, it's not a big deal to install it at once. But if you have many projects with different versions of the tool, then you have problems. And if I give you the project and then you have to spend two days just installing these different components, it's not good. Okay. Fortunately, there are solutions. One solution is to use containers. Okay. And among the container solution, Docker is certainly the one which has the more uh, attraction nowadays. It's also a pretty elegant uh, solution that we see more and more often, at least at the developer level, with our, uh, with our customers and contact. So that's, we can say that's ma mainstream technology nowadays. Um, 
And the idea is that we want easily that you download the project from GitHub and you can shoot the whole infrastructure in a matter of minutes. That's, that's, that's the deal. Okay. And to do that, you want all these components installed. Okay. And what Docker does, it says, oh no, I don't package you a virtual machine with every si in everything in size. inside. I will package small components, one for Kafka, let's say, one for your uh, acquisition uh, application, one for Elasticsearch, one for Logstash, one for uh, the Spark or the Akka processing. So each small component is just like a super light virtual machine. Okay? It's a container. And the good thing about that is there exists plenty of pre-existing containers. I don't have to take a, an empty container and install a Kafka. I just go to Docker Hub and say, oh yeah, I want Docker image for Kafka version 0.10. And that's it. More clever people than I did package the stuff. And that's super useful. And you do that for Elasticsearch and for Logstash, for all the components. For a lot of components, you have prepackaged uh, images. I think that you can even orchestrate these uh, different components because they need their name, like a DNS somehow. So you will orchestrate that with maybe a Docker Compose file. That's one solution where you say, OK, I have an Elasticsearch server, and its name is Elastic, and I, et cetera, et cetera. So the, each component knows, each container knows how to talk, what is the address of the other one. And the Docker file for all this infrastructure, I don't know, it's maybe, I don't know, 30 lines long, something like that. It's not that a big deal. All right, and if we go back to our uh, architecture, now which is technical architecture, we have these different components and we package them in the container, okay? So we have one container for acquisition. Ah, Kafka, we want to make it redundant, okay? And have a zookeeper to orchestrate that. Okay, let's shoot a couple of containers with zookeeper and Kafka. Elasticsearch, the same thing. We want to have more than one node for our database to see how it Okay, how it behaves. Let's shoot a few for them. Same thing for processing. Okay, let's, let's make one container. And we have this, uh, this, uh, this uh, infrastructure which is really uh, ready to deploy. And it's one of the use cases we want to uh, demonstrate. And one of, I never did that, in fact, when one of my colleagues loves to do that, to see if I fail maybe, but he just go to GitHub for in front of a customer and check out the code. And then you just need, just need to wait maybe a couple minutes to download all the images from the public repository. And you have the whole application running. OK, we have it. Before to, because the things that now say, yeah, that's great, but I could have done everything in a single Tomcat application. Frankly, getting the, the information, storing it, showing it, starting to file, whatever. Why do you do this? all this, then I could have done that in my single application. The problem there is first, we wanted to have fun. Remember, we are here to have fun, so at least I have. And we wanted to have some fun by discovering technology, so that was one point. And the other point, which is, no, it doesn't scale, okay? What, what if we have tens or we have 1,000 events per second, like we've seen uh, in some domain? A single Tomcat application will not scale, so we wanted to have something more robust on, the, on this field. So we have this oh yeah, medium complex architecture, and the thing is, how does it perform on, in terms of CPU and speed? First number is that when we compare it to the classic SBB HTTP request, it goes way faster. Okay, Something in the order of 50 times faster. And also, it brings back way more vehicle. We can scale up to, I don't know, classic request is 1,000 vehicle position or back. This is not really fair comparison, okay? Because if you go to the SBB, they have so much constraints and so many more customers and so on. So, But it's just to give an order of magnitude that the system can be really uh, reactive. And we didn't push much effort into the performance side of it. The other thing is that the, the, the whole architecture, without the elastic search, it was removed when I did uh, this measure because somehow I burned all my space on the Amazon cluster and wanted to, okay, I stopped the storage. But the whole the thing uh, took 15% uh, of one CPU.
to process data and everything eventually. So it's pretty lightweight. We were surprised by the lightweight as well. Okay, we have a running infrastructure. We can now go to the data. Okay. Oh no, sorry, I missed something. We need. Okay, I, I every time I tell you, yeah, it scales, it scales. So let's tick a few checkbox and see how it scales. Okay, and each component was chosen for the scalability. Kafka naturally can be partitioned and distributed, and it's fault tolerant, thanks to also to Zookeeper behind it. Uh, Logstash. It's fault tolerant. Then to the matter of scaling, frankly, I don't exactly know, but the limit that we see with practical problem is so far beyond the scope so that we didn't really investigate that. The storage with Elasticsearch, again, it's naturally distributed. The default installation comes at least with three nodes. If we use pack streaming, it comes, or oh, it's really coupled with the Hadoop world, designed for the Hadoop world, so it recovers our failure and it distributes naturally this type of, uh, very well, this type of uh, processing. The ACA is a bit more tricky. Of course, my little actors, I can spread them on a cluster of machines. And then there is strategies for uh, failure. What should I do in this or this situation? But the thing is that to really implement that in real life, it can be pretty tricky. It's why we have this warning uh, signal. Okay, if you want to make fault tolerant ACA application at large, okay, you'll need to invest more than uh, than uh, than a couple of days, certainly. And for the Docker, okay, it's done for scaling. We have orchestrator to multiply the different component to have hot update, recover our failures, and then you can distribute that on public clouds like okay, Amazon or Google, we mainly use Amazon and Google for this demo, but if, if you want to, to, to put it more locally in Switzerland, just go to Exoscase or, or Hedora, or I don't know, there is a dozen of uh, cloud provider at least in, uh, in Switzerland. Okay, we have the data, it's time now, to, uh, we, we can process the data, it's time now to, uh, to see them, to bring them from uh, the system to the screen. And we want to visualize this near real-time data. Near, okay, again, near, sorry, I didn't press talk about that. The near real-time is that we are not at the millisecond level. We are more at the second or half a second level for data to cross all the pipeline. That's the order of magnitude. But it really satisfies a lot of needs. Not all the needs, for sure. You don't want your Tesla to, uh, to wait one second before processing an event. But for a lot of applications, that's far than enough. Okay, so here, here is a snapshot of the demo. We have the station, the size of the circle is the number of trains that will leave the station. We have this uh, orange quadrant which shows the percentage of trains that are planned, are forecast to leave late. We have the vehicles. Of course, if we move, o we mouse over a station or a train, it will give us some information. That's it, and the map, you can zoom in and out and so on, because visualization, okay, nowadays it's interactive visualization, at least in the browser. Okay, and here there is a very good news, is that to make such visualization in the browser, there is one obvious choice for the, render, for the library uh, to create the visual components. Okay, this is certainly super common choice, there are many libraries based on, on it, but under that there is uh, disk.js. More, uh, it's a library where that will transform information, data, into DOM element, into your browser element, and somehow to create visualization, the only limit is your imagination. Okay, we can really create uh, crazy things with, uh, with this 3 uh, GS. So that was easy. The other part that we need a framework. And then we will go to JavaScript, choosing a framework, so something that changed, I don't know, every year. There is a new super cool framework, okay? <laughs> it's really hard to, uh, to keep up to date if you are not a full-time uh, JavaScript front-end developer, and even though. For this problem, we used uh, React.js. We used React.js. It's very well suited for large data set. Okay, it's only a rendering, a library to render components. 
And if we couple that with a Flux architecture, that's the diff more or less the default practice, it's really powerful to, uh, to, to handle that. Uh, I don't go into detail of the Redux, uh, of the Redux architecture, but the pattern that is you know, suited where the component register to a central uh, storage to show the data, and then it describes how the, 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 the event goes through action and the dispatcher. The thing with JavaScript is that somehow it's a bit overlooked. Uh, not this application, but we had other applications that were also with React and some way longer ago in Backbone, which could handle up to 100,000 even, even, uh, elements. 100,000 elements, and each of these elements maybe have 50 items uh, into them. And you could handle that, uh, you can handle that on the, on the browser. So you can really play with massive data in the browser. Uh, and, the, and the language itself is not really the limit. Nonetheless, we have to take care of performance issues. And here we see the, the map, okay, the two, 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 which like in the station. This map that consumes something like 15 to 20% of the CPU, just because there is a rotation. Okay, that's it. It kills your CPU. Okay, I, I, we pub I published uh, I a few weeks ago uh, uh, some measures about how this kind of thing can really kill your CPU. So sometimes you have can do great thing in the browser and be killed by yeah these cool CSS transitions. If you make too too many of them, you're dead easily. We talk about visualization and like everything that we do or we should do. Yeah, remember this. I have not seen the talk before uh, before coming here, but we need to test, okay, everything. Uh, and we can test visualization. We can test that showing train at different levels give us different informations. We can show test that if we have small stations that are just close to Zurich, when we zoom out, they are not hidden by Zurich. They just go on top, okay, like uh, like this one. And how they, 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 they react when we zoom differently in, because we don't want linear zooms to be more readable. Same thing for the watch. How does it react when we scale? Does the component, uh, the, the behavior changes? And so on. So we can test. Okay, It's not fully automated test at this level, but at least we have one page where we have all the components okay, in different configuration with mocked data. So it's really easy to inspect and to, for coding Visual, uh, visualization application, that's a really powerful uh, tool, which is maybe a bit out of the scope of today, but I also want to share that. Since then, we pushed the limit of visualization. This is with scheduled data. And then we have up, we have 2,000 uh, vehicles, uh, Wall Street Salon with buses. We can even plot city buses. It's meaningless because they don't move. And it's fast forwarded. So the application here is a real speed uh, on your browser, we just take scheduled data and we fast forward them by a factor of 500 to see the trains go and the bus goes through the country to see. And the idea was how the browser reacts. Okay, how can we how can we digest this information? And of course, remember the my simple clock. If you go to this RGS, then you hit the limit. Okay, and if you don't want your point to to jump from one position because it's not not nice. Okay, you want to have smooth transition and with fading out tails, you need to find something else. And to do this kind of thing, we use uh, DiskGS, but also Pixie, which, uh, which is a library that relies on the, um, on the GPU okay, for some computation. So you can really, and you can couple DISC and Pixie, no problem. And for that, we have to keep up. Okay, that was more recent, so we have to go to Angular. Angular 2 now, we have to say Angular, and observables and so on. Again, these things are described in a couple of posts that were recently uh, published. All right, we did it. We have our user, they are happy. My daughter can play with my map, okay, and that's cool. Uh, now we need to explore the, the data that we stored. We can start to ask questions. Maybe not super clever question, but question to see the, the point again is to, to show how we can do the, the things. 
and we ask a question. So let's focus on Lausanne and Geneva, but I could have said Bern and Zurich. Or, and during the weekdays, what are the moments where train is full or not? When during the day is it most probable that my train will be late? This is a less trivial question. And where in Switzerland are the train the most often are the most often to be late? So we have a couple of quiz. Okay. Lausanne Genève, when to have a seat, it's pretty packed in the morning, a lot of people are commuting. Okay? So this is the, the information, the prognosis information, the capacity prognosis information, which translates to your mobile application by this little icon. Three red uh, person means the train is pretty packed in second class. Okay. So we pulled out the data. Oh, I want all weekdays for trains going from Geneva, Lausanne to Geneva, and by hour, I want to see how many trains do circulate. Okay, so we have the peaks for the rush hours. And within these trains, which is the, the, the percentage or the part of train which are one person, so there is a lot of seats, or heavily packed. And this is a big discovery. We think that between uh, um, seven and nine, there is a lot of people taking the train. Okay, so that's the thing that you will learn today. I was sure you were learning something. <laughs> Same thing in the evening. Okay, so if I want a room, because it's hard to find a spot at this time, I can wake up earlier. That's the solution. Okay, so much. Uh, or, we live in a capitalist country, we can pay and go to first class and make the same uh, measures for first class. And then we see that it's never really packed between Geneva and Lausanne. The idea here is not to make a big discovery, a scientific discovery about the, the, how the railway system works, more to see how we, what we can do with the data. Question, if you have a train at one moment during the day, when is it more likely to be late? Is it at six in the morning, at noon, when is it? It's a question. Sorry? In the noon. In the evening. Yeah, we did not couple. That's a very good point. We, we could have coupled other information. We didn't do that yet. At midnight, in the night, there are very little trains. Okay? That's the red line shows the number of trains that are circulating. There are very, very little trains during the night, but they are very likely to be late. Don't ask me why. All right. Where are the trains the most delayed? So here is a map of Switzerland. Here is uh, some kind of histogram of the number of trains that are in the that, 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 that transit through these different places. So here we have a hotspot in uh, Zurich. Now we focus on where they are laid the most often. Okay? Ah, yeah. I think you have a lot of late trains here. Huh? And also, okay, if you go to Zermatt, <laughs> you are likely to be late. Maybe it's less important, but <laughs> okay. Tooling. How do we do that? We want, I, want, I want a tool to analyze the data and then be able to show the results, be convenient to produce this result, but also to share the results with you and to share the code that goes to produce this result, because my code is certainly buggy. So you want to be able to reproduce my result on other data or whatever. How do we do that? Share the code. Let's so say that this morning. It's all this movement about reproducible science. Okay, there are notebooks that I used to do that, and this is Jupyter, it's a Python, so even I had to do a little bit of Python for, for this presentation. So you write code, read the, read the, read the lines, uh, read the, the stored data, maybe you transform it, and then you make computation, and within your notebook, you see the result, you can execute a few lines, and see the result, and modify this line, so it's a very interactive way to dig into the data. And if you are a fan of Python, Jupyter is a very good way to go. Jupyter, so it's a web application, it's interactive, it's strongly inclined towards Python, although you can use other language. You have really to beware, nonetheless, about the size. Just for a few months, the data that we show you was for four or five months. Okay, it takes up, I don't know, a few gigabytes of TSV files, five, four gigabytes. You cannot load that, load that all in uh, Jupyter. So you have to sample that. And if you want to process all the data in the notebook, you have to move to other solution, to Zeppelin, which is a Spark-oriented, uh, parallel-oriented uh, 
a notebook, or if you want to have fun and make beautiful figures, go to R Studio. So, we have it all, okay? We have our whole infrastructure. We could remember, don't pick up, uh, don't say Octo or Alex at Octo tell you that oh, each of these components was, was the solution for your production architecture. We can talk about that, okay? It's a proof of concept project. We could have used, or in fact, we tried several other bricks uh, along this project, like Angular 2 or whatever, other databases and so on, and the list is really big. So there is more than one way uh, to do it. It's a pug, it's on GitHub, and just which is cool that it's open us plenty of questions, and it's a never, okay, it's, we don't see the end of questions that we can start uh, pursuing with this, uh, this, uh, this project. And I'd like to thank you very, very much. I think maybe we have a couple questions, if, if you have a couple of questions. Maybe just an easy question. How do you do the modelization of the data? So how do you know how the best way to, to create models for the data? Okay. And maybe what, what is the best standard, if you know, if there's any standard for the geo, 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 geo data? Because I think at the end it's just, just a, like a geodata. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, the thing is that this approach, somehow you try to turn it around. You model the data depending on what you want at the end, what the queries you want. In fact, you, you, you know what the queries you want, and somehow you will very often denormalize the data because it's, more e it's easier for the analysis, it's easier for the visualization, so you are not afraid about denormalizing, which is kind of a crime in, uh, in the other domain. But you really often see, what are the queries, what do I need, and I model the data uh, regarding to what, uh, what I need. Regarding the, 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 the standard, uh, if you go to Elasticsearch visualization, then they will, okay, you're, it would be easier if you name latitude and longitude according to their standards, but that's more or less uh, all that it has. If you go to some databases, certainly you can use geo objects, so it's easier to then make queries about, I don't know, packing things together, who is close to me. So there are some, some databases that will have some, uh, some um, geographic coordinates. Uh, so, thank you very much.